Welcome to the Audrey Hall Show. In June of 2022, the Supreme Court ruling in the Dobbs versus Jackson World Health Organization case reversed two decisions that provided the fundamental right to an abortion and gave the authority to regulate abortion to the states. It was the overturning of Roe v. Wade. The reversals of those decisions galvanized voters, many of them women, to organize and register to vote, to march, to run for office, and to fight for their reproductive rights. And that July 4th, a group of local women demonstrated in front of the Middlesex District Court in Framingham. And it was there that the discussions and idea sharing led to the creation of the Framingham Coalition for Bodily Autonomy. And the official founders, Grace Sneddon and Samuela St. Pierre, they're here today for an encore appearance to talk about the work, the challenges, and the outcomes of this past year. So welcome, Grace and Samuela. Nice to have you both back. It's been quite a year since you officially organized, and you've seen a lot happen in that year, not just within your own efforts and locally, but around the world in the aftermath of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So, you know, what has that looked like to you, and how do you think it has impacted life in general and the lives of women around the world and, of course, in our country? Sure. Well, as you said, after the overturning of, of uh, Roe with the Dobbs decision, I mean, since then, nine states in uh, the country have completely banned uh, abortion and about a dozen have severely restricted it. Um, so that's exactly what we were afraid of and everyone kind of knew it happened. All these states had these trigger laws waiting, just like frothing at the bit, you know, um, waiting for this Supreme Court decision. And so I think we've learned from that side and it's like, what can we do in our own legislation as liberal progressive states to fortify our laws so that we can protect the fundamental right to an abortion, to reproductive rights, gender affirming care, um, basic human rights for basic human rights for right. people. Um, so in the aftermath and, and over the course of the last year as you've, been organ as you've been organizing and trying to rally people together, you've heard a lot of stories, you've seen a lot of efforts. You know, what, what do you feel has to be first and foremost in the actions that are being taken or should be taken? So I think that what we've seen a lot of positive in, in the states that are acting to protect protection or to show up the protections that we have now already in Massachusetts and others to protect people who are coming from out of state if they need to come here to, to access care, which they will. Um, so, you know, those those sort of shield laws are, are extremely important, I think. Um, and then acting locally is hugely important. Um, you know, it, it doesn't take much to sort of tip into a place where you know, the majority in your government is not super supportive, you know, of, of really taking the bold action that you need to take in this time. Um, so I think that the pressure needs to be kept on and activists need to stay. Is it a local too. issue? Like you say, you know, you don't always have the local support that you think you need. Is it a local issue? It's absolutely a local issue. I mean, just even in the court of public opinion at a local level, if we were to revert back to how abortion was seen even 10 years ago, the even if on paper the access is there, the likelihood that people actually take advantage of their right to have an abortion or right to access birth control will severely be lowered. And when that's the case, mortality rates go up for women. They just do. That's science. And we find that, you know, you're seeing these anti-choice people and groups become more and more emboldened. Um, and that will keep happening. And um, where, where we think it can't happen is where people will get lazy. And, and that is where these little pockets of sort of well, many fascists spring up and they want to take away everyone's rights. Um, and we're just not going to make it easy on them. Where do you think they can happen? You say, you know, what happened here in your own backyard? So when we were working, on, we worked on um, the proclamation to protect reproductive rights um, with the city council 
It was initially an ordinance and ultimately a proclamation. So let's backtrack a little bit. How did that whole idea come up? What was the idea? What were you trying to accomplish? The, well, so a couple, of, it came to us from a couple of different sources that this was even, you know, uh, something that had been tried. A local ordinance to regulate crisis pregnancy centers. Um, and so that had sort of tried and failed some places. Um, we really wanted to work with the city council as much as we could to try to shape it and, and ultimately have a good piece of legislation pass um, to where we could feel confident that the crisis pregnancy center here now and any in the future um, would be held accountable if they did provide bad information to people seeking care. And why was that more of an issue in the aftermath of overturning Roe v. Wade than it was before? I don't think it's more of an issue. Um, it's, it's that we can't not pay attention to these things. So while Massachusetts is a liberal state, we still have these organizations that are protected under, um, under religious uh, protections. And so they can always sort of claim that we're just helping. Um, what do you mean by they're protected? I guess they, so they, they can exercise their right to their religious beliefs, right? right? Um, and so sort of behind... But then does that make them a religious organization? Or is, are you saying that these are not religious organizations, so they, uh, but they're, they're operating behind religious beliefs? What are you saying about that? So they are faith-based organizations, the majority of them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's certainly the money that is behind them um, and is from the churches and the conservative donors and things. Um, there's also funding that goes to them in some states, not necessarily in Massachusetts, um, public funding. But they're a religious like tax revenue. Tax yes, tax revenue. Yes, goes to but them. they're a religious organization. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that while yes, we want to be um, more vigilant now. Um, this is always this has always been an issue, and they just sort of fly under the radar. Okay, so you have these organizations. Um, medical organizations or religious organizations? What are they? So they're not medical uh, publicly because. They would be under you, They would be. Um, we would be allowed to. We, as in the state, wouldn't be allowed to regulate them if they were. Um, but instead, they are allowed to perform pregnancy tests, uh, ultrasounds, and things like that under Massachusetts law, and do all sorts of really sketchy things like dress in lab coats, have clipboards, seem official, like therapists or ultrasound technicians, when in fact they're volunteers. I see what you're saying. And so, so you're saying it's the image, it's it's kind of how they present the themselves of as more of a clinical type of appearance than they are really authorized to be. And the what? centers, they outnumber abortion clinics in Massachusetts as well. Okay. So often what can happen, what does happen, um, is we've had testimonies sent to us, like told to us as well from people here in Framingham. Uh, they've gone thinking that they were going to get the full spectrum of options once they found out if they were pregnant or not. But these places do not, will not refer you to an abortion clinic, will not even tell you it's an option. If you ask them for a referral, they won't give it to you. So they will try to talk you into adoption or keeping your baby because they provide free diapers. Okay, great. There is a lot more to, I'm not a mother, but I imagine there's a lot more to raising a kid than a free pack of diapers. Mm -hmm. And so the, the reason that it's so important like locally is that like, we, don't we don't have a Planned Parenthood here. We don't, have, uh, we don't have any center that provides abortions in Framingham, but we do have a crisis pregnancy center. And so that was what inspired us and the testimony that we've gotten from local women and their experience going there about how they were treated and the information they were given and the information that was withheld. Why do you think they use the word crisis as opposed to just pregnancy center? I think they, I think 
The way that they reach out to women is to say, you know, do you, if you feel alone, we're here to help. Their brand of help is for, the, for them to convince you that what you want is wrong um, because their whole goal is for you to continue a pregnancy. And I think that, you know, even the most benign amongst them couldn't deny that, that that's their agenda. However, they won't be upfront with that when you call them and when women present themselves there. And that's why activists and others have had to be educating people about the, the dangers there. Um, <clears throat> there is a larger conversation taking place around crisis pregnancy centers nationally. Um, Elizabeth Warren has been driving a lot of that conversation. Um, and then in Massachusetts, there was money to do public information around crisis pregnancy centers in the old budget under Charlie Baker. He vetoed it on his way out. It's coming back in the current budget. He vetoed that. Yes. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I did read that on August 4th of 2022, Senator Elizabeth Warren tweeted the following. She said crisis pregnancy centers uh, will often lure women seeking reproductive care by falsely advertising themselves as legitimate medical providers. She and Senator uh, Menendez supported a bill to crack down on what they call deceptive misleading practice in the crisis pregnancy center realm. Uh, has anything happened with that? Do you know? Nationally? Yeah. It has not. Okay. Nothing has advanced nationally. Um, what about locally? What Anything locally that can be can be helpful that you said you tried some local efforts. We did. We tried to pass an ordinance that would have some legislative teeth. So an um, ordinance has the legislative teeth is what you're saying, and that's why you would were going have, for that. Yes. Okay. Because it would have said, if these organizations break X, Y, Z rules, then ABC will be the fine, the penalty, the strike system, whatever it may be. However, since that the city council didn't feel that that would hold up in court. Um, we negotiated into a proclamation, which is basically the city saying, in good, you know, in good faith, they would like crisis pregnancy centers to be honest with the people going in, and there's a set of expectations there, and we are trying to hold them accountable to keep the crisis pregnancy center accountable. How do you do that? That's a great question. <laughs> so what we would like for them to do now is to do what they said they would in the proclamation. And the first piece of that is getting the information, the, the, um, the attorney general's warning about crisis pregnancy centers. Um, there is one from Mass Health, a warning there. Um, and then we have resources um, Meaning they for legitimate warnings? care. Yes. Okay. So they're supposed to publish that on the website, on the city website, and the Department of Public Health is supposed the to publish it. The city of Framingham is supposed to publish that on the city website? Mm -hmm. They unanimously signed a paper that said they would. Where, where are they supposed to publish that? On, on somewhere on the website, maybe the health department? Or is there a specific Well, the health place? department, yes. Um, the... City website, I have to go back and look at the specific place, um, but the um, the city website uh, is just is just supposed to house information that already exists. And it's also a link to the attorney general's, um, uh, there's, a sp there's a space to submit your claim if you feel you've been wrongfully treated by, by a crisis pregnancy center. And then the state can use that information to launch an investigation, something that we in Framingham, according to the authorities, do not have the capabilities to do, don't have the money, don't have the inspectors, et cetera, et cetera, which like, okay. So then provide the pipeline <laughs> to the state that has that. And that's one of the reasons that we built our own website that has the Attorney General's warning. It has the link to submit your claims of being wrongfully treated by these clinics, clinics and very severe air quotes, and it has a it has a copy of the proclamation on there. It has the dates of all of the city council meetings that we've been to, subcommittee council meetings that we've been to, who was there and who we were speaking to. Because right. we've been very transparent, we want people to have access to to information. So if you're looking for abortion access or or 
a way to speak to somebody who can tell you what your reproductive choices are, we have that on our website, but if that's a small website, we're not an official, right. you know, We can put the website up so that people know where to go to at least look at your website. Yeah, we can do great. that. Uh, but I understand, you know, what you're trying to accomplish and uh, hope that that does happen since your efforts have been consistent and, and that's something that you're striving for to help others. And I'm sure there's good work that's being done by some of these pre crisis pregnancy centers, right? You're not saying that all everything they do is wrong. No, I think they, I think, I think unfortunately in our like capitalist system, we have major <laughs> holes in what community support could look like, what mm -hmm. social support could look like. And I think that leaves room for potentially predatory organizations like crisis pregnancy centers to fill in those gaps. Because if you have a child already and you need diapers, where are you going to turn? You can't, like, if you don't qualify for certain benefits or you're undocumented, then what do your children not deserve that? Then Birthright's doing, doing you a favor. They do great work for people who want to continue our pregnancy, and that's where it ends. Mm -hmm. So it's about options, is what you're saying. It right. is about options. Well, and it's about or at least pregnant knowing people's that. safety too. I mean, you know, they should they should know what they're getting when they walk into a place. Right. So you would think that living in a state like Massachusetts with a governor like Maura Healey who has made very pronounced proclamations, signed executive orders, uh, you know, to support safe access to reproductive care. Uh, and continued access to reproductive care in the state. You would think that this was not an issue. You would think that, okay, we don't have to worry about that. People don't have to worry about that in the state of Massachusetts. Look where we are and look who the leaders are and the decision makers are. Uh, but yet you mentioned Elizabeth Warren, obviously, uh, Senator from Massachusetts. We have Congresswoman Clark, we have Markey. These are folks who are elected, who seem to support the same ambitions that you're pursuing, uh, the same goals that you're pursuing. And yet in Massachusetts, you still have to be concerned is what you're saying. Well, I think that that's, I think that we're in a great position to have the ear of our elected officials, like Priscilla Souza has been amazing, she's our state representative, Jack Patrick Lewis, you know, for them, because they actually have the ear of those people who are who are higher up. But it's not like they're just doing by free will what they'd like. They're doing what they believe their, their constituents want. Maybe they're doing what they believe is what's right for their constituency, but what they're actually doing is what's going to get them reelected. So we, as a collective, as women or as people, non-gender specific, who believe in reproductive rights, have to put the pressure on and turn the volume up to say, hey, we need these rights enshrined so that not just the people of Massachusetts, but the people from other states who need access can get access mm -hmm. to their full range of reproductive rights. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, and even even as a, a city, um, it was just really eye-opening, the conversations around um, what ultimately was a proclamation, because there just there is this conservative vein in Framingham um, that came out and was pretty ugly about this. And so we know that sentiment exists. We know the sentiment exists that, you know, that called us names when we were trying to do this um, and that does not want women to, to have control. Um, and so while obviously the state and the, and the national government are who regulates our laws, we still have a, a culture in Framingham that discourages participation by, by many people. And, um, and that means that when we're trying to take action, um, there are always people who are afraid to come out and speak. Um, there are people who are afraid to be involved in the community that we're involved in, the way we're involved in it, but we're not afraid of them. You believe so strongly in what you're doing, you're not gonna let any of that stop you. We just, we just can't have this culture that this like weirdo right wing culture 
that wants to prescribe how everyone lives, taking root in Framingham. Is that what you felt? Is that what you saw through going through that whole process? Is it, is it, it did it oh, it's, seem so much more than you ever thought? It's absolutely like high school level bullying, name calling, intimidate, like verbal digital intimidation. And it's laughable. These people don't show up when it matters. They just show up behind their keyboards. Although I will say that a handful of them did show up in person and it was a little like concerning. But at least those people put their money where their mouth is. Right. But meanwhile, the droves of them, the majority of them, just hide behind their keyboards and complain and make comments about how we look, who's dressed a certain way, just absolute frivolous things. Mm -hmm. But if you have thick skin, like maybe you don't want to be called. I probably can't even say the things we've been called mm -hmm. on this show, quite honestly. And I get, like I said, I, I don't have children. And if I did, maybe I would feel differently about being called those things on Facebook, right? Yeah, you know, and none of us loves it. I have a thin skin, I will cry. Um, but it's necessary that there be other voices um, besides just whoever the majority is at the time, you know. Um, and so we'll continue to speak up. We have met a ton of new people through this process who want to be engaged um, and we're really positive about the future. Um, but to achieve that, we're all going to need to be engaged. So let's talk about that. Because what you're talking about is an environment that is really unwelcoming of engagement, so to speak. Uh, and so how do you build engagement? How do you build momentum? How do you build coalitions in order to further these causes that are important to you in, an, in, an, in a culture like that? Well, we've tried to provide like different opportunities and like venues for action taking um, within our coalition. So there's people who are really good at writing, like just like drafting up drafting up like letters that can go to le legislators or people in office. Um, there's other people who, you know, want to be out on the street at city council talking in front of people. There's people that are, uh, would prefer to come to our postcarding events, you know, before the, um, was it the primaries last year, um, we wrote thousands of postcards for pro-choice candidates everywhere from Pennsylvania to Nevada, um, Georgia, I can go on and on. And those, those were great for meeting others. It wasn't like publicly broadcast or anything. Nobody's name was posted online. And it was just like, if you wanted to be on the list to be invited, you got on the list. Once you were on the list, you were invited. And then it was like in the privacy of the situation we got so much done. The majority of the candidates that we postcarded for did win their primaries. Congratulations. Which was a huge win just for, like, arguably humanity, like, I feel <laughs> like in this country. Because <laughs> we are responsible for everyone, not just the people of Framingham, right? We're responsible for, for one another. Yeah, and I think a huge thing that I've learned over the last year is that um, you can listen and take on, bo take on board all of, you know, sort of the feedback and input from, from city officials. You can, you know, listen to the concerns of, of your group members, but at some point you just have to move forward. Like, you know, we, we have to be proactive and we obviously cannot just trust that the government is gonna take care of us. It was eye-opening for you, I can tell. The, the process of the proclamation was eye-opening for us, yeah. And we didn't feel especially, like, stuck up for by the city council who was, you know, supposed to be working with us on it. And we were almost, what, a year, like, it's been almost a year of work. And like we've said, like, the proclamation has not even been posted. Was it, do you think there was some kind of fear because it's a controversial topic that sometimes sparks a lot of emotion and... You know, do you think that that was part of it? I partly think that. I also think that the city council was hearing from people behind the scenes that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. So there was a little, there was some of that going on as well. Yeah. But that's exactly the thing about getting people to participate. So like when we believe that 
our beliefs are what the majority of our neighbors believe, we don't feel the need to call and to, to write to our city council, right, to our representatives, because we assume that everyone else just agrees they're pro-choice, they're whatever, fill in progressive ideology. And because of that, that's, that's not how anti-choice people feel. They know they're in the minority, so they have to be louder to make up for the, the quantity. And like that's really been like at the crux of our work has been how do we activate the people in this community who we know do care, who we know like do do believe the things that we believe, into writing that letter, into sending that email, into voting, right? Yes. So that's really a it's like almost um, a fight against apathy or people who take things for granted. Yes. Yes. And it's been a tough time because. Believe it or not, people felt traumatized by the pandemic. And this is all in the aftermath of yeah. isolation and separation and health issues and loss and fear. Everything that happened during the pandemic and changed things going forward, it's not something you can just look at as a single event by itself. You know, you have to look at it in the context of the world. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, I, I I know that I, I know that weirdo right wingers is not a very uh, delicate choice of term. I guess the bigger concern beyond just like a person or a group of people is the division, right? So the division that exists nationally, a hundred percent exists locally, and it just continues to get ratcheted up um, because uh, because politicians go against each other and and make their personal business all of our problem, um, and you know, there's just all of these things at, at play that are personal. Whereas, you know, it seems like a, a wild thing for us to be even talking about in the public sphere, people's health care. But this is where we're at, and it is raw. It is. And I remember in her words when she was signing the executive order, Governor Healy said she didn't feel that it was a medical issue at all. She felt that it was marginalizing to women and other more vulnerable populations, these kinds of efforts and attempts. She, that was part of her statement that she made when she announced her executive order uh, to make abortion drugs readily available in Massachusetts. Yeah. Yep, yeah, we've got some ideas there too. What are they? Um, so one idea I've been kicking around um, that we, it's been in the paper since last year, even the year before that there were um, on college campuses vending machines, um, not just for Plan B, that should be in there, you can get it over the counter. Fewer unplanned pregnancies, fewer abortions, everybody. Um, and so those are in a couple of college campuses. We don't really see why we couldn't have them here in Framingham, even in a public place. You want to talk a little bit about for the people who don't know what Plan B is? Yes. Plan B is emergency contraception. Um, Plan B is a not the abortion pill. Um, the way it works, and a fellow organizer of ours, Kim Kamatis, explained the birds and the bees to us, which is the way it works, <laughs> is that um, it, so it, it uh, prevents the egg from releasing. So while, you know, after sex, a person can still get pregnant over a number of days, the egg can be fertilized, it won't if you catch it. So is there resistance to making that available? Uh, we, we don't know. We imagine so. Um, <laughs> we imagine we'll run into it. We, uh, we're just getting that started. We're just getting started with the, just thinking about those things. Mm -hmm. um, we did an interview with Sophia um, Harris, who's the editor of the student paper at FSU, and um, that was pretty eye-opening too, um, and just around access. They have a health center where they can get Plan B, but they have to set up an appointment. So that doesn't help if you need it literally need it. the next and, day. And there's a wait for the appointment? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the places that they refer to are all like 20-minute drives anywhere they need to go. So. Two people have sex and a condom breaks, and they want to take Plan B so that there's no chance of getting pregnant, and they need to set up an appointment, and then could, and then have a car, and then have a car to drive there yeah. to get it. That's that's a real barrier to pretty prohibitive. Yeah, very yes. Prohibitive. So they can get medication on campus, 
-hmm. But if they have to get an actual abortion, then they have to travel. Mm -hmm. um, but that's an ongoing series that is going to be going on. So mm -hmm. that's there's lots going on a around lot going access, on. but access is the big thing now. I think. Yeah, and I think you know the access on college campuses is very important, but obviously there are a lot of people in many places who don't have access. Yeah. And if you're in college, you're lucky if you're this health center and you can have access, but there are a lot of people who don't have that at their fingertips. Where do those people go? Right, and I think that that's why we've made it a goal to make sure that you know if we have any impact in the, in the community, it's that we are making sure that people have access to information and to care. Um, so we have housed everything on our website now. We definitely need to publicize it. Um, but we also are always looking for opportunities to help to educate the public. Mm -hmm. What do you think are some of the initiatives that you'll undertake in order to do that? Um, well, <laughs> some of them um, in, in order to, to just help educate, pe help educate people. Um, so we want to continue to do public community events. Um, we have had a number of different ones. The postcarding obviously is huge for community building, um, but we also had our members get together for National Women's Day and International Women's Day um, and share ideas. Um, so we think that through our members, we can educate more people. Um, and if we, I mean, if we have to be getting out in the streets and talking to people and giving out handouts and things, we can do that too. Um, but that's, you know, all of our efforts are going to go behind making sure that as many people in Framingham as possible have all the access to information and to care that they could possibly need. And we'll work together with groups like SMOC. Um, I and another of our members actually is on the Women, Children, and Families Commission. Um, we intend to you know, partner with them as much as possible, so. Yeah, and like the thing, like you've been, you've been saying is like we live in Massachusetts, we actually do have like the access laws and we can get like free or close to free birth control. Like we have Planned Parenthood right in Marlboro. Um, we have, we have, we have things, but people don't know. <laughs> and if you Google it, depending what your past searches were, you will see something different than what I see as what's available to, to either of us when we type in a Google search. When I Googled you, your organization, I got the Crisis Pregnancy Center coming up. Well, see, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. And like, and like, that's not Right, that's not like a local problem, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the algorithm, but it does have local damaging effects. Mm -hmm. And so it's about <laughs> like, okay, we have all this great information, but like we need other people to know what plan B is, like what, uh, what forms of birth control are actually suitable to them and is available to them, all of that stuff. So it's like meeting people where they're at are you working with organizations like NARAL or Planned Parenthood? Do they know about you? Are you going to them for resources? Are you joining efforts with other organizations? Yes, yeah, so NARAL is Reproductive Equity Now, now. <laughs> um, and we have worked with them. Um, we first got in touch with them around trying to make an ordinance happen. Um, and then they invited us to march with them in Pride, which is very exciting. In Boston, yeah. I know, in Boston Pride. Um, and we we do want to continue to part, partner with them, and, and um, they've sort of reciprocated that sentiment. Um, we are aware of a number of pieces of legislation that are coming up, um, and we're going to have an opportunity potentially to testify um, in favor of one of them, um, which is the... Um, it's What was the legislation called? Um, it's one that is... Uh, to make sure that cell phone data and things like that can't be used to track. Oh, the tracking data. Yes, yes, I've been reading about that. Yep. Yeah, that's a very important piece of legislation mm -hmm. because what they're saying is, is that the data miners uh, are buying the location information off of people's phones and sometimes selling it uh, to crisis pregnancy centers or people who are anti-abortion 
so that they can see who's going in for information at Planned Parenthood and other places to, to get information about abortion um, or to get medical care, any kind of reproductive medical care. So that's, that's I, so, I'm not as familiar with it as you are, but that's... No, you're right, you're right on track. So not only, not, and it's really, it's really an insidious uh, a strategy that they have here, because not only are they building fear into what you're doing with your body, but even knowing anything, like tracking anything about your body is now going to be politicized and used against you. So any period tracking act can and will be held against you. Right. I don't think most people know that the GPS on their phones that shows their location is then being sold. Oh, yeah. It's freely being sold right now to organizations that then sell it to other people for other whatever reasons they want. Uh, they're selling it. So one thing that I really love about this generation that's like in high school right now, I was at a barbecue the other day, and this kid in high school told me that what him and all of his friends, like the whole baseball team, uh, has done in solidarity with their girlfriends is download period tracking apps and just like host their own cycles. Oh, no. <laughs> just, just, just to throw off the information and to bombard the, mm -hmm. and to bombard the um, mm -hmm. network. So is that something like women who are using an app on their phone to track their menstrual cycles? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That they that can... data is also being mined and sold? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like uh, what I use, um, well, I don't want to like promote it here or whatever, <laughs> um, that specific app, but they like sent me this whole thing that was like, hey, just let you know, we're not selling your information and we would never let them. And it's like, cool, but if you have a data breach, right. then you get to wash your hands clean. Right, right. And then like the last 12 years of <laughs> my like yeah. inner cycles can now be not just like sold to to like right wing people who are like in obsessed with my menstrual cycle, <laughs> but also to pharmaceutical companies who want to say, hey, you're irregular here, here, and that, or here are what your symptoms are because some of these apps do track your symptoms. So I can have targeted ads sent to me about migraines or bloating or whatever normal thing happens, but it's targeted through that. And like that's just disgusting and almost inevitable. But what's not inevitable is legal action being taken against women or people who are tracking their menstrual cycles on their apps and that's hopefully yeah be... i mean people may say oh it's just ads you know they just want to sell you their products but you're saying it can go way further than that sure i mean in states like missouri uh you know like you're not <laughs> a lot of these states you're not even allowed to cross state lines to get proper health care and then come back because you will be charged as if you had done it within those state lines like this is some Margaret Atwood world that we are allowing to be constructed around us. It's happening as we sit here. And to sit around and be like, that's so sad for people in Kentucky is, is extremely short-sighted and irresponsible, not to mention lacks quite a bit of compassion, which is what we actually need to move forward in this country. So, so are you, of course you said, you know, you're working with well-known organizations, well-established organizations, joining forces, sharing resources. But on a local level, are you also trying to build strength through coalitions and getting involved in helping other causes that all relate to human rights? Certainly. Um, we had a little bit of a lull there for a few months, and then we'll get back into an election cycle. and, and um, working on trying to help uh, pro-choice candidates get elected all over the place. Um, during this lull, we decided to do sort of a solidarity summer um, and getting to march in Boston Pride came right in line with that. We obviously care very much about trans rights and people's right to their body, period. Um, so that was perfect alignment. Um, however, there's, there's local groups that need our help too. Um, so. We, we should up in solidarity for Framingham Pride, yes, um, but also um, for Moms for Gun Sense. Um, and, what, oh, the Brazilian Women's Group, after there was that assault downtown. Um, we really think that it's important that we show up for other groups, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that, A, there can be, you know, a, a mutually benefi beneficial relationship with other 
groups, um, but we think that it's important to our community too, that there's just this growing solidarity on the side of people who care about people. Yeah, it's not just about like our little bubble, like getting everything that it wants. Like it's about building a city that, like the city's still pretty new. We get to decide what we want it to look like. And so like, yeah, showing up to the dog park opening, showing up to, you know, showing up to the things that we want to see more of in the city is important too. It's not always about um, demanding things. It's also about giving and being of service. Makes sense. Do you want to grow the organization? Do you feel that there's a population that you need to connect further with in order to increase your effectiveness, your voice? We do. Um, so I've been saying that I want us to be big enough to be impactful, small enough to be nimble, because the situation on the ground is constantly changing. Um, growth probably does look more like alliance building, coalition building. Um, we are a pretty, um, in our larger membership, we're a pretty straight white group. Um, certainly have queer people, we certainly have people of color. We have a divide to bridge in this city. Um, there is segregation in this city, period. We're trying to do that, get outside of our bubble by, with, through building relationships, both personal and professional. When you say there's segregation in the city, it's, it sounds unusual because when you talk to people in Framingham and you say, what do you love about Framingham? One of the first things most people say is, I love the diversity. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you say we're a segregated city. Sure, I, I we're think, diverse. Um, I think that everyone pockets. loves the diversity in theory, but it's like, it's not easy to, to see your knee, you know, take a walk through the north side versus take a walk through the south side and like see, like, see where like the diversity is. And no one likes to drive through downtown because it's so traffic packed. Maybe that's the only reason. Mm -hmm. Well, and it probably has to do a little bit with our political landscape too. I mean, it's just there's different groups that just don't talk to each other. Um, and it's all, it's also legacy, you know, it's a legacy of certain neighborhoods, you know, some neighborhoods being better resourced than others. Um, and the efforts at building community not reaching far enough, mm -hmm. I don't think, into communities. Um, they're more centered around kind of individuals, it feels like. And I think that, that you know, the communities that have been historically underserved in Framingham, like, have found, are, like, incredibly resilient and have found people that are, like, within within our groups that are like, all right, well, then we'll build it ourselves. And you have all these amazing programs that go on that just live in that little bubble, like on that corner, right? And so then to come over and be like, hey, we're doing this thing, and they're like, you're here to ask us to do something is pretty, like, obviously not the best way to do it. It's pretty entitled, actually, mm -hmm. to expect people to join you in a coalition when they've got enough going on and like what have we done for them yeah how do you change that i think that's why we're trying to keep showing up for other people um but i think it does happen one relationship at a time too and a lot of us are involved in different things um within the city and so we have opportunities to interact with people who are different from us all the time it's just a matter of you know seeing them as like a potential friendship a you know yeah and just like keep inviting them to stuff because like until you know people don't know your intentions i think like it's hard to know someone's intentions until like you sit at their table so like i could invite you over tonight you could say no to me but on the 17th time maybe you say yes and then you can see what my intentions were when you're actually having a meal with me good point yeah that is a good point good point and there's a level of suspicion sometimes too, reaching out. Which fair. And that is totally very fair. fair. Yeah. And what do you and want from me? You know what I mean? Yeah. What what what's really your motive? You know, we, is it genuine or is there something else there? Right. And, and we lot. certainly don't want to show up like trying to save anyone. Mm -hmm. That's not what this is. Um, we we truly are trying to build partnerships, and that's why we haven't like overnight sort of you know created this big organization. 
Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily have in, intentions to do like a women's march kind of thing. We need to be able to maintain independence. I think it's like a lot about like listening too. Like I think like a lot of our goal isn't even to like recruit new people yeah. for our army, you know, whatever crazy conspiracies people are saying online. <laughs> for our abortion cult. <laughs> for, for our, right, exactly. All, the, all that. You've been called that? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not so much about that, which I think that's like a lot of suspicion of like, oh, they're going to want me to volunteer or say something, whatever, um, or they're going to try to change my beliefs. And it's not about converting people to like our belief system or whatever. It's like, how can I build a relationship with you in which you feel empowered to talk to me when something in the realm of bodily autonomy comes up or reproductive rights or gender affirming care so that, like, because I, now I have all these connections because I spent the last year working with all of these people in power. So where you can come to me in private or in public and say, hey, this is what's happening with my daughter. This is what's happening with me. Um, what, what gives? What can we do about it? And like can say, well, I don't know, but I have an entire coalition that collectively, like, there probably is something that we can do about it. And then we have a more holistic understanding of Framingham's needs. Because every time we come on the show, we're telling you what we believe. And from our perspective, does need to happen in Framingham for everyone to have equitable care. But that answer is going to evolve with any luck and grace as more people join the conversation. You threw a lot of terms out that some people might not even understand. I mean, gender affirming care, I, you know, that's like rolls off your tongue, like, you know, second nature, but a lot of people may not even know what that means. Um, bodily autonomy, people may not know what that means. So there's a lot of education that has to go on, I would imagine, as well, because what's n normal to you in your everyday life and in the causes that you're rallying behind may not even resonate with other people. Right. And, and, we may not have agreement on our agenda, 99% um, of our agenda with somebody, um, but we might have that one interest in common um, that we can work on. And so that's, we, we don't want to operate in like a, a steamroller kind of way where we're just like, abortions for everyone. Like we, we care about maternal health. You know, we, we want for there to be healthy, happy, planned families. <laughs> and although you are trying to get a wide range of information out to women about all of their choices, you're not saying that you're leaning towards pushing women towards one choice or the other. The whole point is like, so when we say bodily autonomy, is that people have free will, free choice, and what they do with their bodies. And we believe that the only way to make a choice is to be, have the information of all of the choices available to you. Yeah, bodily autonomy, the definition of bodily autonomy is an informed, un, the ability to make an informed, uncoerced decision. And so that's the core at, at, about your body. That's the core of everything that we do. Um, that you know, if you have all of the information, then you can make your own decision. If you're being deprived of certain information willfully, um, or if you're having other people influence you, then you're not making a free decision. We're not on the phone with people who are pregnant, convincing them to terminate a pregnancy or to keep a pregnancy at all. Like that's not what we do. <laughs> I think it's important to clarify that yeah. because it's obvious that you don't like it when and you're against having any of that information withheld, sure. specifically because it's being withheld also to deter the choice of abortion. So that might lead people to think that you want them to consider the choice of abortion. I and do so, want them to consider the choice of abortion. Okay, but you want them to consider that along with every other choice is what yes, you're saying. Yes, and then openly make, the, I don't think you can make an actual free choice if you don't realize everything that's on the table. So that is why, and like the reason that we have to scream abortion, the A word from the tops of the mountain is because like it's the stigmatized choice and the one that's swept under the rug and the one that's um, not offered at these crisis pregnancy centers, for example. And so if we're extra loud about that choice, it's to counterbalance the, the rest of what people are hearing. Good, good point, good point. 
And of course, I'm sure you run up against people who feel that abortion is a form of birth control. I'm sure you've heard that, that people think, oh, you know, this is not, and they, or, you know, just all the things that you hear about that choice. And there are so many stories about saving women's lives and, um, you know, from the, from really awful situations during pregnancy. Uh, and so these are choices that are being taken away. And, and it's healthcare. Mm -hmm. Abortion is healthcare. Gender affirming care is healthcare. Um, it, there's, there's no sin at play. We, we need to take the stigma away. Why do people think gender affirming care is not healthcare? I don't think they believe trans people exist. I think they think that it's a game that people play. And this is not a game, this is people's lives. Um, but if you, say trans, if you say trans people don't exist, and if you say abortion is murder, there's nowhere to go from there. You know, we can't, like those extremes, to speak to those extremes is a waste of our energy. We need to try to move the middle. That's a pretty important statement, moving to the middle and not wasting your energy. Can you focus on that? Is, are you focused on that? Is it hard to stay focused on that? It's a challenge. Some yeah. days, yeah. <laughs> so we're better it's some days. Very matters. emotional. It's a challenge because often, you know, if we're in this end of the spectrum and we're making it rainbow, sorry, people over here, and, and, and the anti-choice people, whether it's gender affirming care or abortion or, or reproductive rights are over here, then um, if we're the two loudest people talking, it can really feel like we did something if we spent today commenting on all of the comments, responding to everything so that other people can see that we are morally superior and smarter and have our resources. But at the end of the day, we did nothing but boost this post on the algorithm. And that is a trap that we are all committed to not making. Mm -hmm. And we have to support one another in the group chat to make sure that, that we don't fall into that trap because, because then they really do win. It doesn't matter how many sources we have, how many scientific studies, it doesn't matter how historically deep trans people have existed, even, even with the constant political attempts to erase queer culture in this country alone, let alone the world. Trans people have existed and we can find, we can find examples of that through since the beginning of this country. Um, it doesn't matter because those people aren't, it, it, they don't need to cite their work to say what they, ha they say. Mm -hmm. And so, like Grace said, it's more important to find the people in the middle who are like, yeah, I believe what you believe, but why should I take action? And it's our job to have an, a compelling enough answer to have them pick up a pen. Yeah. What's gonna make you feel a sense of success and accomplishment with all your efforts? I don't foresee I don't foresee us sort of reaching an end point. Mm -hmm. um, I think that little things along the way make me feel accomplished. Um, I think when people show up to events and they're, you know, they're excited and motivated to, to do this work, that's rewarding to me. Um, you know, and when opportunities come up, like have come up with reproductive equity now to work with them on things, um, those things are rewarding. And so it's not really the end goal that we're after, it's the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that you will follow up and continue to follow up to get the responses that you're looking for, to publicize your proclamation, and to help you con continue to form the partnerships, to show up for other people throughout the community so that everyone can come together uh, and with a better sense of in the middle of having those conversations that you said are so important and helping people understand one another, uh, opening it up for dialogue, to provide resources and education because it sounds like you've put a tremendous effort into that and you'll just have to come back again and give us more updates as time goes on. Uh, but thank you for being here today. Absolutely. Thank Appreciate you. it very Thank much. Thank you so much for having Great us. Great talking to you. Special thanks to my guests today, Grace Snedden and Samuel St. Pierre. Their dedicated efforts continue in the fight for women's rights, human rights. Learn more on their Facebook page and website, Framingham Coalition for Bodily Autonomy, 
and stand up for what you support and believe in. Women's rights are human rights. Thanks for tuning into The Audrey Hall Show, where you will always learn something new. Thank you.